so I think I've emailed quite a few of you, met very few of you in person. Um, so I'm Amy. Um, I'm Head of Continuous Improvement at Mola now. Very nice, vague job title, but uh, it's actually quite fun. I get to do special projects about helping the business kind of improve the way it does things. Um, and over the last three years, that's been quite heavily focused on training and skills development, um, predominantly in fieldwork skills. I think given the people in this room, I can probably dispense with the background for why we did that um, and the context, but we all know we're going through quite a serious skill shortage, particularly in the field. Um, we can't drop our standards of work. If we take brand new people, like graduates with no experience, somebody has to give them some form of training. And so that usually falls to the site supervisor who's also trying to run their project. So we just wanted to see if we could do something about that, basically, and take a more formal approach. Um, so we designed initially just one programme for new to sector trainees. That's now three programmes. And today I just want to give an overview of what they are, how we went about designing and delivering it, and then lessons learned um, for not just MOLA, but I, I guess more widely as well. So... As I said, the very first programme that we introduced was for new to sector people, so people with no experience or archaeological qualification. Um, we did this for various reasons. First and foremost, it's kind of an untapped resource. There's a whole load of people who want to work in archaeology, but it's quite difficult to get a job unless maybe you know someone in a local unit who's willing to give you a shot. Um, we also thought it might help make MOLA's workforce a little bit more diverse, maybe. We're constantly drawing upon the same group of people. Maybe that's part of the problem. Um, and there was part of us that really hoped that it would appeal to some local residents. They're the ones who are affected by the development projects we're working on. They're invested in their local area. Um, so we hoped that those sort of people would apply. Um, the programme is six months long. It's the first three months are spent with a trainer on site every single day in a ratio of no more than five trainees to one trainer. Um, so it's a very structured, supported place to learn on site that doesn't require the supervisor to kind of keep an eye on them and try and teach them. Uh, at the midway point, they have an assessment to make sure that they've kind of understood the key stuff. And then they work more mingled in with the team and their salary goes up a little bit as well. Um, I'm really pleased that since April last year, we've had 24 people on the program, um, which is more than I was expecting. <laughs> I planned for five, um, but the work just kept coming. Um, and I touch on this a little bit more later on, but the trainees are just a really great group of people to work with. Uh, they are so enthusiastic that it kind of reminds you why you got into archeology span in the first place as evidenced by Sally, who was just super excited to be drawing a section. Um, <laughs> really excited. Uh, and I think maybe sometimes we lose sight of the fact that lots of people find this job really, really interesting. Um, so we designed the program. We thought, great. We then realized there was a whole group of people who we still couldn't recruit. We could take archeologists who had some experience. We could take brand new people and train them up. But there were the middle group, which was graduates who didn't necessarily have any field work or commercial experience. So we designed a graduate program. Um, the learning outcomes are exactly the same as for the trainee program. Obviously, they've got a foundation of knowledge to build on. So it's more about filling in kind of skills gaps um, and developing the skills that hopefully they learned at university. Um, we obviously wanted it to benefit people who hadn't been able to get a job in archaeology. Uh, it actually benefited a lot of people who hadn't been able to get a job full stop. Um, and the programme is three to six months. So every single graduate gets a six-month contract. So whatever happens, they, they get six months commercial experience with MOLA. But they can take their final assessment any time after the first three months. We basically just wanted to reward people who were ready to progress and get that recognition of becoming an archaeologist, but also provide a safety net for people who weren't quite ready after three months. Um, and it's quite interesting. I think about half the graduates actually took the full six months, um, which is interesting, I think. Completely coincidentally, we've also had 24 graduates on the programme. Um, and 
since April last year, and I think the quote from one of the graduates very well summarises that need commercial experience to get a commercial job loop that people get stuck on. That is really frustrating for people. So we designed the programmes, started to deliver them, and then decided to do something quite ambitious, uh, which was to apply the same structure for trainee supervisors. So same approach, but this time for experienced field archaeologists, we required a minimum of two years commercial fieldwork experience. And it's about providing an environment for them to learn all the other skills that come up with being a supervisor, health and safety, liaising with clients and curators, managing a team, learning all of that in a, an environment where they're not ultimately responsible. Basically trying to do the opposite of a baptism of fire. Um, and giving them an opportunity to learn as they go. Um, we've only just started the programme, we've just hit the midway point, so I have no results to, show, to tell you. Um, and we've only taken on six people so far. Um, half were MOLA employees and the other three were external. And because I don't have a quote from them, I've instead included a quote from one of our trainers. And I think that's another really important point, is that it gives an opportunity for existing staff to share their expertise and feel valued as a trainer. Um, so this trainer was working as a project officer for several years, decided to move into training and has kind of been given a bit of a new lease of life. Um, it's been a real good boost to morale. So I thought I would include that as well. So in terms of designing the programmes, once we decided we wanted to do them, we kind of followed a series of steps. First and foremost was to look at the national occupational standards for archaeological practice, those kind of government authored, I think, documents that set out the skills. Are they not? No, oh, okay. <laughs> That's embarrassing. <laughs> You're welcome. So they set out all the different skills and knowledge needed for different activities. So it was a really good starting point for designing some learning outcomes that related to that. Um, and then we looked at what CIFA require for their levels of membership. We thought it was a good added bonus if someone could leave the program with what it took to be a practitioner or an associate. So once we'd got a set of learning outcomes, we decided how we were gonna go about it. We decided to go for modules. So almost like a qualification, like you would do a university degree. They're all broken down into nine different modules, which is a very clear way of structuring it. Um, when we came to writing the content, we made sure we didn't do it in isolation. It was just me and one other person at the start, and I think two people writing how to be an archaeologist is a bad idea. Um, so we asked lots and lots of different people at MOLA to add something in, contribute, um, and that was a nice boost to morale as well and crucially designed with adult learners in mind. We were conscious that some people wouldn't have been in a learning environment for many years. Um, so to try, we didn't want to do it like a lecture. Um, so we did really interactive sessions, um, used lots of different methods to appeal to different learning styles, and crucially try to have a cycle where they learn something in a classroom and then they apply it straight away and then on site, and then they learn something else. <coughs> And it's that kind of, that's been shown how adult learners do best, is by putting something straight away into practice. Um, with that in mind, we created some workbooks. I think the trainee supervisor one came out at 270 pages of exercises. <laughs> so it's quite a big, chunky thing. Uh, but we just made a load of exercises for people to test their knowledge, basically, um, in the classroom where they can get immediate feedback and then a CPD if they want. I think the most crucial overarching aim when we were doing the content was that we wanted to teach them why we do things, not just how. That way you create people who genuinely understand what they're doing rather than just following a set of steps that they've been told. And that's been crucial the whole way through. So just as an example, this is one of our exercises on placing slots on site. On most sites, obviously, it's not an archaeologist who decides where the different slots are going to be located. Um, but them understanding how a supervisor reaches that decision and why we need to excavate certain relationships and things like that makes them a better archaeologist rather than just looking for the flag that says where they're going to dig their slot and digging it. Another example is dumpy levels, not just teaching them 
this is how you make your calculations, but this is why we use them on urban sites more than rural sites, and this is why we need to know the height above sea level, not just height below ground level. So that's been really effective. That was my main takeaway, is teaching why, not just how. Um, in terms of the modules, um, I mentioned the modules, I'm sure you'd all quite like to know what we actually teach them. For the trainees and graduates, it's kind of top and tailed with context for their role. So we start with a bit of the overview of the framework that enables the work that they're going to be doing. And we finish with what happens after we come off site, why we need to share our results, and why the site archive matters. And crucially, what they can then do on site to help all of those things. So they see themselves as part of a process, not just, I'm here digging on a site. And then the bulk of the modules are teaching them the kind of core parts of their role. And we did a similar thing for the supervisors. So the first module, we're not teaching them how to be a project manager, but we do want them to know how costings are generally put together and why that might impact some of the decisions that have to be made on site. Um, module two was huge. I think it's two and a half days of learning. <laughs> um, but it's moving beyond just methodology to strategy. Um, how do you adapt your plan um, to various different influences? And then it moves all the way through, basically, um, to the very end of the process, but got, getting them to think about uh, what they can do as a supervisor on site to help their archiving later on, for example. Um, and we give them certifications like Triple STS, Cat and Jenny, GS6, all, all the big suite now. So when it came to then delivering it, there were just a couple of points I wanted to raise. Uh, it needs dedicated people to do it. As I said, you can't just ask a site supervisor, here's someone who's never stepped foot on site, can you teach them how to be an archaeologist? Uh, we've now got three permanent staff dedicated to training, um, just to deal with the amount of work that we've got in the team, um, directed by myself. We started each programme with a week in the classroom. And that was actually really useful because it gives us an opportunity to prepare them for what site's going to be like, and it allows us to cover those big ticket modules um, before they even step foot on site. And then for the first half of the programme, each module is introduced in a classroom session each week. So that's that loop that I was talking about where they're constantly learning a bit of theory and then applying it, and learning a bit of theory and applying it, and drawing their on-site experience back into the classroom sessions. The other important loop is feedback, obviously. So our trainers would sit down with them every week, and um, this is the progress form, which is really useful for visually charting. It literally shows them, oh, this is where I need to work a bit more on. Oh, I've actually done really well in this. And then there's a feedback form, which gives more uh, detailed information. And we found that formal feedback was much more effective than informal, which tended to go in one ear and kind of out the other. So, um, I'm not going to spend too long on the assessment, but I think it's important to mention all three programmes are CIFA approved, and as part of that, we had to <coughs> carry out some form of competency assessment at the end um, to measure how well they met the learning outcomes. We also decided to add a further assessment to help us almost kind of take the pulse and see how they were doing. So trainees have that midpoint assessment at the point from which they go from having a trainer with them every day to not. Um, and their salary goes up a little bit to reflect increased independence. The graduates, on the other hand, have an entry assessment. Day one, we give them a test to see um, where common skills gaps are so we can tailor their training. Those entry assessments are really interesting, and I would love to be able to share <laughs> some of the results at some point, because it effectively shows what universities are teaching and what they're not. We could probably talk about that in a whole other session, um, but it is really interesting data. Um, both the trainees and the graduates then have a final assessment that basically assesses whether they're ready to work on site as a field archaeologist. We decided to use six different methods of assessment, which seems evil, but is actually to kind of recognise that different people perform well in different ways. Putting everyone in an exam is not necessarily fair. Um, and that's worked really well. And by doing a portfolio where they comment on their 
learning journey also means that they have a portfolio of work to show at the end. Similar approach for trainee supervisors. We've just finished this midpoint assessment. Um, so they spend the first half of the program shadowing a supervisor on site, where they're not ultimately responsible, but they can try out doing a toolbox talk, updating the RAMs, those sorts of things. And then they supervise independently, which they've just started doing. And the final assessment we haven't done yet, but will be uh, a bit more full on. We're going to assess them for a day on site, uh, sort of clipboard and hand style. So uh, I'll be able to let you know how that goes. <laughs> so I just wanted to finish off with the most important bit, which is some lessons learned. Um, first and foremost, what's been really interesting is that it's very clear to me that with the right training and support, People without a degree can perform just as well in the role as a field archaeologist as people with a degree. That's crystal clear to me. Um, partly by the fact that they have nigh on identical average pass marks. Um, the top quartile of performers was mostly trainees. Um, it, the data's all there, really. Um, and again, that's a conversation for another day, I think. Um, the other thing that I'm really pleased about with these programmes is I do think we've deliver genuine social value and employment opportunities for people. So 81% of our trainees were locals, which is really good. 67% um, of the graduates were unemployed, full stop. Only one of the 24 had ever worked in heritage at any point, which is quite sad. Um, and we had a really strong pass rate for the two programmes of 95%. Another learning point is that when recruiting people who aren't archaeologists already, casting the net as far, as wide as you can is the best route. We all advertise on the same space and um, the same people use that space. So we contacted local colleges, we put an ad in the newspaper. Um, there's a jobs board called Countryside Job Service, which was brilliant because it's literally aimed at people who want a job working outdoors. Um, and we ended up with 16 applicants per available post for the trainees. There is a huge number of people out there. I think it was 350 in total or something. Uh, there's a huge number of people out there who want to be archaeologists and just need the right training and they can do it. Uh, in the aims of being transparent, um, the retention rate could have been better. So we did have some trainees drop out, primarily because they just weren't, it wasn't what they were expecting. We've now put a question in the application form that says, describe to us what you think a typical day will be like. Because the people that say, I think I'll be in a lab, I think I'll be researching in a library, we say, OK, I think you've not quite understood what the role's going to involve. Um, but what I will say is, most of the people who decided to stay in archaeology to take the final assessment then stayed with MOLA. So it's more a case of them then deciding archaeology is not for them rather than Thankfully, deciding mode is not for them. Um, the other key point is it does need resource. It needs a dedicated space. We experimented by trying to do some of the training in the site cabin with a projector. Doesn't work. Um, it, people barging in, wanting to use the kettle, things like that. It just doesn't work. Uh, and it needs people who you can invest in to be good trainers. Uh, it is a skill set training. Not just anyone can do it. Um, and so we've given them, they've all got qualifications in coaching and mentoring now, um, mental health first aid awareness, that sort of thing. So that's an investment. And overall, it does represent quite a big investment in terms of producing it. Um, but I would say the return is exceptional in terms of we have grown the team. Um, crucially, with the skills and knowledge that we want them to have, you're kind of molding them from the outset to kind of be your, the employees that you really want them to be. Um, the boost to morale is really important, and I wouldn't undermine, um, underestimate that. Uh, someone asking you for your expertise and asking you how to do something is quite a nice thing for most people. Uh, and as cynical as it is, our clients really love it because it's a nice big tick in their corporate social responsibility box. Um, and actually, they've been willing to pay, fund quite a lot of, for example, the trainer time on most of our projects has been fully funded by the client, um, which has made it a lot more viable. But I'm under no illusions that MOLA is in a 
slightly unique position in being able to run this for 54 people just because of the size that we are. Um, so in terms of next steps, taking it all a bit further, we've been transforming all that material that we've put months creating into creating. We're now using that for guides and e-learning modules for the wider workforce so that they get something out of it as well. Looking at other skill shortages that maybe we could apply the same model to. We've kind of shown that it works at least twice now. Maybe it could work for other skills, not just field work. And then this very vague statement, <laughs> helping other organizations with their training. I couldn't think of the right way of wording it, but what I mean is, we have put all this time and effort in, and it seems to me a shame for it just to sit in Mola's vault, if you will. <laughs> um, and I would be really, really interested in, it's that idea, I know that there are smaller organizations who can't put months into training staff. Maybe there's something that we can do to bring more people in. Um, yeah, so thank you very much. Um, shall I ask if anyone has any questions? <laughs>